Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for a very kind introduction. And uh, you know, it's my great <laughs> pleasure to visit this uh, very famous uh, institute. And uh, this morning, actually, I was in Sevilla <laughs> to attend a conference. So I thought, you know, since I'm you know, in Spain, I should visit a few you know, uh, famous places. So that's why I'm here. Okay, so today, I will talk about uh, 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 AIE AI nominogenes, uh, a family of uh, conceptually new materials. <clears throat> so first of all, probably you want to know what is AIE. Some of you may know, some may not. AIE stands for aggregation induced emission. And uh, if a molecule has this kind of AIE property, I will call it as a AIE gene. OK, so, oh, by the way, this is our university in Hong Kong. OK, so it's uh, rather, you know, different from <laughs> the institute here. <laughs> so we are, you know, uh, face the ocean. The air is fresh, and uh, we are, in a sense, in the countryside of Hong Kong. OK, so the good thing is that, as I just mentioned, the air is very fresh. And uh, another advantage to be a professor there is that uh, you know, students, after dinner, they have nowhere to go. <laughs> okay, they just go to lab to work. Okay, so uh, you know, I enjoyed working with uh, my students, and I will you know, uh, thank them at the end of my presentation. So uh, this is the outline of my presentation. You know, I will try to identify some problems and ask some questions at the beginning. We know that the luminescent materials and the devices are very, very important. Actually, the science about the light has been there for a thousand years. Okay? In some sense, it's a very matured area of research. And of course, progress are still making in the area. Here are some examples. Okay? You can see that the 2008, the Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to the people working on GFP, green fluorescent proteins. Okay? And uh, six years later, you can see both chemistry and the physics prices are given to the people working again on fluorescence microscope and uh, lighting emitting diodes. Okay. Now, here I give you a few examples of the high-tech applications of uh, luminescent materials. The first example is uh, this uh, optoelectronic device. Okay, so you can see this is a mobile phone. OK, the display, OK, the display is, is, is OLED, OK, it's OLED, organic light emitting diode, in which the luminescent materials are utilized in solid state. Another very important application is in life science, OK? So you can see that the fluorescent materials, materials can be utilized to image, OK? the fine structures of our cells and all these living you know, things. And uh, you, know, you know that the liquid medium for life basically is water. Okay? So in this case, the luminescent materials are utilized in aqueous media. Another application is a chemical sensor. Okay? For instance, it's very, very sensitive. Okay? So see, for example, if you want to know what are you know, pollutants, in water, you can use fluorescence as a chemical sensor. Okay, so again, in this case, you know, you are using luminescent materials in aqueous media. So here, there's a problem. You know, from the, the example here, you can know that the organic luminescent materials are often used in the solid state and the aqueous media. Okay, now in the solid state the molecules experience a very strong pipe interaction because they are located in very close vicinity. Okay? So that will lead to the formation of aggregates. In the aqueous media, because uh, you know, many of these kind of luminescent materials are aromatic, hydrophobic compounds. So they are incompatible with water because they are hydrophobic, right? Hydrophobic means they hate water. So 
you know, if you use high concentration in aqueous medium again, this kind of luminal force will naturally form aggregates. The question is, what happens when luminal force are? So this will go to a very famous photophysical effect named Kantian Quanqi, which has been there for hundred years. Okay, so according to this website, it says that a molecule quenches its own fluorescence at a high concentration. Why? When the country is high, the molecules will get close to each other, they will form aggregates. Okay, so because of this, this concentration quenching effect has often been referred to as aggregation cost quenching or ACQ. And the ACQ effect actually has been very, very common. So common that it has become a general belief in the research community. Okay, so we see seeing believing. I give you a few examples of this ACQ effect. You see this molecule from the name, you know that it must fluorescent. Okay, it does. You can see when the concentration is very very low, the quantum yield is 100 percent. Indeed. Okay, it uh, emits very efficiently. However, if we increase the concentration to just one percent, which is not that high, the quantum yield was, or, is already dropped to three percent, from one hundred percent to three percent. If you further increase concentration, you can see the quantum yield goes to zero. Okay, it becomes non-emissive when the concentration is high. Okay. Now, this is a, a, a derivative of this uh, fluorescing you can purchase from uh, sigma average. And the daylight, you can see the powder. Now, normally you use UV light to be excited, and you, you expect to see very strong emission. It does not, you see nothing. Obviously, this is very, very bad for this kind of application, right? Because in the solid state, you want to have a light emission, but however, it does not emit at all. Okay, now, you know, you can dissolve these kind of things in its uh, so-called good solvents. Let's say if you dissolve in THF at low concentration, you can see if you use UV to excite, you get a very strong emission. Now, if I add water into THF, because uh, as I, I mentioned, this kind of aromatic compound, compounds don't like water, okay? So when the water fraction is high, you know, the, the molecule starts to form an aggregate, suspend in water, in, in aqueous Okay, now you can see the emission is weakened. Now if you further add water, the emission is completely gone. Although the solution is still transparent in the daylight. Okay, because the nanoparticle, you know, suspend in the aqueous medium, you see it. Very transparent. However, if you excite, is nothing because because of the ACQ effect. Okay, aggregation cost quenching. Okay, so this is the first you know problem I identify ACQ aggregation cost quenching. You know, people have studied nature for hundreds, thousands of years. Okay, so eventually they come to a conclusion that molecule is the smallest unit, okay, with, uh, you know, that kind of a uh, property. So this kind of, uh, you know, recognition lead to the establishment of uh, molecular science. Okay, so everything, we study molecules. Okay, so we have a molecular chemistry, you study interactions, we have a molecular physics, study, you know, structures, properties, all these kind of things. And this has a very, very significant implication to our scientific research. Okay? Here I'm going to ask an even bigger question. Okay? If you think about it, most photophysical laws has been built on molecular behaviors in very dilute solutions. Okay, just give you one example. You know, if you still remember the, the Bill's law, okay? You know, your professor must teach you that 
don't use high current racing. And the high current racing bill snow will not you know, be valid anymore. Okay? So many many things, many many laws, theorems, rules, diagrams have been built on dynamic solution data. Because you know, people want to know molecular behavior. Why? Because they believe everything is decided by molecular structure. Okay? So the question here is that uh, are all these kind of theorems are still valid? Or applicable to the photophysical processes in the aggregate state? This is the form we actually use. Okay, see, so for example, for all that application, it's in the solid state, that's aggregate. Okay, for, for bioimaging, again, you use nanoparticles. You think it's, it's, it's dissolved, actually it's not. Most time, actually are lot of aggregates. Okay, so, you know, these kind of laws, you know, build a molecular species, may be valid, may not be. Okay, so, uh, on the other hand, there's a big room here for new scientific research. Okay, so, you know, if we talk about uh, photophysics, this is a diagram you cannot, you know, <laughs> ignore. Yeah, Bronx diagram. Again, as I mentioned here, this diagram actually is drawn on the very dilute solution data. Okay, so it's applicable to the single molecule species in dilute, but how about the aggregates? Okay, now let's see this diagram. You can see this uh, is a big diagram. However, actually, if you read here, everything is forbidden except this one, this transition. Okay, so that's the so-called fluorescence. So for this big diagram, uh, theoretically, only this part is, uh, is allowed. That's really boring, right? So the, you know, the that's a so-called Kasha rule saying that uh, it doesn't matter where you excite, eventually you come to S1 and it go, goes back because other transitions from the higher excited state are forbidden. Okay, so the question here is that whether we can develop some anti kasha system. And if uh, the answer is yes, that means you can use a higher excited states. Okay, S2, S3, S4, okay? And, uh, you know, potentially you can have this kind of transition, and, uh, you know, Eventually, you can utilize all these uh, singlet excitons. Okay, so this is the first question. Another question is that we know that uh, this time, you know, they, this intersystem causing is forbidden. The question is that can we facilitate this uh, intersystem causing? If it does, then we can utilize this uh, fast fashions. Right? And also, if we can have an anti kasha system in the triplet excited state, then you know, we can utilize these uh, higher you know, triplet excitons. And if the answer is yes to all this, that means we can utilize the whole Yabrunsa diagram. And life will become you know, really colorful. There will be a lot of fun, right? Okay, so I identify some problems and ask some questions. Of course, asking questions is to try to solve the problems, okay? So now I will utilize our journey of AI study to try to answer the questions I have just asked. Okay, so here I give you five pieces of uh, small stories. The first one, of course, I will try to you know, solve this ACQ problem. It has been there for 100 years. People really hate it, right? Okay, so you can see that this is our so-called initial discovery in 2001. Another year, I was very excited. I thought, oh my God, probably nobody saw this before. Now I understand actually this is nothing new, okay? People already reported this uh, 400 years ago. But unfortunately, you know, it escaped people's attention. Nobody cared about it. Okay, but anyway, let's see what is this. You can see this molecule is really strange. It's, it's exactly opposite to the ACQ effect. Okay, now 
this molecule obviously is a hydrophobic aromatic compound. It's soluble in many common organic solvents. Let's see again if you dissolve in THF. Okay, when the country is very, very low, they see nothing. It's no emission at all. So that means the molecule species is not fluorescent. Okay, now if I add water into THF, okay, when the water content becomes high, molecule will start to form aggregates. Okay, again, the solution is transparent, the mixture is transparent. However, you have a lot of particles here. Now, if you excited the, 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 the see the emission. Okay, now the more water you add, the stronger the emission. So in this case, in this case, the molecule species is not the emission. The emission is induced the, by the formation of uh, aggregates. So I call this as uh, aggregation induced emission or AIE. Okay. Now this video is to tell you the difference between ACQ and AIE. Okay, for ACQ molecule. Initially, the solution is very emissive, but uh, if you add water, oh, oh sorry, <laughs> if you add, um, if I, if I add water, you know, if from aggregates emissions gone. This one initially no emission. If I add water, emissions turn on. Okay, so they are exactly opposite. Okay. Now, let's try to understand what's going on. Okay, because the ACQ has been there, people already understand what's going on. The, 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 the problem is that, the, you know, if you read the literature, every paper tells you why aggregation is not good. Now I have to tell people why aggregation is good. Okay, and yet I have to tell people why that seemingly, seemingly very conjugated aromatic compound is not emissive at all as a molecular species. Okay, so we spend a lot of time to try to understand today, to make a long story short, I will use this video to tell you how we thought about the process. Okay, so you know that the molecule normally is in the ground state. Now, if you excite it, okay, you pump it to excited state. Of course, the excited state has high energy. You must go back to 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 the ground state. Now, let's see this water flow. Is the light beam, okay? Then this is radiative decay. If everything goes back from this channel, very happy, very very emissive, okay? However, there's another channel here. You can see the water flow is converted to mechanical energy by the move of the wheel. You cannot see mechanical energy, right? So that's why we see this is non-radiative decay. Now, if uh, this process predominates, then too bad. All this photonic energy will be converted to invisible form of uh, energy. Okay, so the molecule will become non-emissive. However, if somehow you block this channel, then everything will come back from here. You will see very strong emission. Okay, let's see our molecule system. This molecule is named tetraphenylethylene, in short, TPE. Okay, TPE is a typical molecular rotor. And actually, in the excited state, the double bond is open because you know that this kind of olefin molecules can undergo cis trans isomerization. The double bond must be open in the excited state. So, once the double bond is open, the whole thing will rotate like crazy. We don't need to have a very complicated physics, okay? This kind of molecular motion. Okay, so the molecular motion converts photonic energy to thermal energy, which is invisible. So that is why, as a single molecule species, you don't see any emission at all because this process dominates. However, once they form aggregates, now this kind of molecular motion will become really difficult. Okay, so we call this as a restriction of intra molecular motion or RIM. Okay, the ion basically block this channel and the molecule will come back from here. So you see very strong emission you know, in the aggregation state. Okay? Now, this is a more scientific picture. Okay? 
Okay, so you can see that. Uh, oh, by the way, this paper is uh, published by my friend in this country, in Spain. For yeah, he's my good friend. <laughs> okay, so I like this uh, picture. You can see that. Uh, you know, once you excite this molecule, this double bond is open. Okay, so in the excited state, this is not a coplanet cool anymore. So you go to this very twisted conformation. Okay, without much energy. Okay, you overcome a, a small energy barrier, and you come here. However, in this state, the homo will increase dramatically, and at this point, it have a, this so-called conic intersection. So at this point, the excited state will go back to the ground state without emitting anything. Okay, so that means you block this channel, and you 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 make the solution non-emissive. Okay, now. However, in the christening state, now this kind of uh, conformation change will become horribly difficult because the surrounding molecule will not allow you to 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 go go this you know this point. Okay, so you block this channel, you open this channel. So that is why the crystal becomes a uh, highly emissive. Okay. Okay. So basically. You know, I think AIE solved the ACQ problem. Okay, now we don't worry about the aggregation. You know, actually, in some sense, the more aggregates, the better. Okay. However, okay. Anyway, in other sense, we realized very efficient solid state fluorescence. However, you know, false fluorescence is very very important. If you have been working on all night, you will know that actually 75% of excitons actually are triplet. But unfortunately, unfortunately, okay, if you read the textbook, textbook will tell you forget about the fast resins for pure organic compounds. Okay, many of these kind of fast resin materials are, are either inorganic stones or organometallic complexes. Okay. Now, for pure organic, it's what, re it's what people really want to achieve. Okay? Now, so basically, the RM mechanism I have just discussed is to tell you that uh, if a molecule is active in, in either rotation or vibration, theoretically, it should be AI active, meaning that their solutions will be non emissive, but their aggregates should be highly emissive, okay? So I ask my students to make any compounds which are active in rotation and or vibration. So instantly, because my students are very good in synthesis, okay? So instantly my students made hundreds of these kind of molecules, okay? And uh, very happily, all of them are AI active. Their solutions are not fluorescent at all. But if you know you get aggregates, they, they become very very emissive. Okay, so here I give you some examples of structures to tell you that, that we can tune the color of the emission from blue all the way to red. We can give you any color of your interest. Okay, and the quantum yield can be up to one hundred percent. And if you still remember the picture I showed you. For conventional system, once they form nano aggregates, the emission is gone. Okay. Now you can see this is the nano particles suspended in water for our AI genes. They are very very emissive. Okay. So this suggests that our AI genes are very useful for biological applications. Okay. And the powders are also very very emissive. Okay. This make our AI genes very suitable for the fabrication of. Uh, in the optoelectronic devices such as uh, OLEDs, right? Now, for all these kind of molecules, although we are very happy that we have developed so many AI systems, however, if you think about it, actually they are still obeying this uh, cautious rule. Okay, the transition is from S1 to S lot, and the emission is fluorescence. If you still remember the questions I have asked, one is. Uh, whether we can have an anti culture system. Another one is, uh, you know, I'm very much interested in, 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 in fast resins from triplet excitons. 
Okay, so I was uh, thinking about this possibility, but my friend in US, Yvonne, okay, already published a paper when we were, you know, trying to do something. Okay, so in this, this is his uh, AIE system. You can see the transition is from S N to S naught. So obviously that's that's an anti-Kasha system. Okay, because the, for his AIE molecule, the S one is a, is a so-called dark state. Okay, so this is uh, still fluorescence. So, you know, we, because uh, <laughs> they already published, so we thought maybe we can go to triplet. We go to, you know, fast fashion system. Now, you can see these are very simple molecules. Very simple molecules. So this is benzophenone. Okay, I don't know whether there's uh, any synthetic chemist. Okay, if you are synthetic chemist, your students will use this. Uh, as a, as an indicator, you know, for the distillation site, it's very, very cheap stuff. Nobody thought this kind of molecule would emit light, okay? And indeed, you can see this is a benzophenone solution. If you're excited with UV light at the room temperature, you see nothing. It's no emission at all. However, if you cool it down to 77K, they all become very, very emissive, okay? You can see the higher the concentration, the stronger the emission. So what does this mean? Actually, this is very, very common. A lot of organic molecules, if you cool that solution to nickel nitrogen temperature, they all be, most of them, okay, will emit light. What does this mean? This actually, if you translate this, this is to tell you the RM is, uh, the mechanism RM is at play. Okay, because if you cool it down, at the 77K molecular motion will become difficult. They start to emit light. Okay, of course, 77K is not, not interesting. Okay, nobody will have a device with a nickel nitrogen tank attached, right? So, if you can identify a process at the room temperature to restrict the molecular motion, so potentially this kind of thing should emit light. But of course, the process must be simple, easy. Otherwise, nobody, again, nobody <laughs> is interested. So what is the simple process that can restrict molecular motion at room temperature? Okay, so we were very lucky. This kind of molecules actually can easily form crystals. And now, if you're excited at the crystals, you can see they all emit light. Okay, and even more interesting is the lifetime about five milliseconds. You know that for fluorescence, lifetime normally is a lot of second. This is a, you know, much, much longer. Okay, million times longer. So these are fast fluorescence. Okay, fast fluorescence. So here, basically, you know, we succeed excited to have pure organic compounds to realize efficient room temperature fast fashions. Okay, so we call this as RTP, room temperature fast fashions, which is, is kind of hot now. Okay, many people are studying organic compounds in you know, RTP processes now. Okay, and of course, why they are so emissive? Because there are multiple inter and intra molecular interaction to restrict molecular motion in the crystalline state. I will not go to detail, okay? Now, you know, we have been working in the area for some years. So here I just give you one example to tell you that we can utilize the RTP to do some very interesting work, okay? You can see this molecule, you know, if you're excited, you get wide emission. Okay, single, mo single molecular wide emitter is what people are really interested in. Normally, if you want to get a white light, how you do it? RGB, okay? Red, green, and blue, RGB, right? You mix three dyes together, you get a white emission. This is uh, kind of troublesome, okay? You have to control the ratio. And another very important thing is, is the so-called durability. You mix them together, initially you get a wider emission. But so after some time, 
you know, these kind of things we have fish separation and they form, you know, ivories or they form crystals, then, you know, basically, in fact, we come into play, eventually get, you know, all kinds of uh, dirty colors. Okay, so one single molecular value emitter is what people are really interested in. And we can get a value emission. Why? Because there are two transition, transitions in, in the triple state. The first one is the normal Kasha system from T1. You get this yellow emission. Actually, there's another transition from Tm, okay? And that gives you blue emission. And you the blue and the yellow are complementary. So that is why when the UV light is on, you get two colors, blue and the yellow, they mix together, give you white. Okay? But once the UV light is off, this fast process will disappear, you only see the yellow. This is not an isolated phenomenon. Okay? You can see all these kind of derivatives have this feature. You can see one you know, fast process, another slow process. But they all are, they are all fast processes. You can see the lifetime. It's not a lot of second, a millisecond process, okay? They all have two transitions, okay? But of course, only this one gives you wider than emission, okay? Others are all kinds of different color. You know, meeting that, you can, you can tune the color by changing the molecular structure. Okay, so here, I talk about uh, fast versions, RTP. So here, I will talk about so-called non-conventional nominology. You, you may ask, what does, you, <laughs> does this non-conventional mean? If you remember, in the, in the introduction, I told you that most luminescent materials are aromatic compounds. Now, the question is that, if a molecule has no even single aromatic ring, do you think they can emit light? Okay. You see, you see this polymer? This is an oligomer of a malonic anhydride. Do you see any aromatic ring? No. It's not conjugated even. Okay. However, you can see the solution, the concentrated solution is emissive. The solid powder is also emissive. Okay. However, if you separate this malonic anhydride by RQ chain, you can see the solution is not emissive, the powder is not emissive. What does this mean? This suggests the oxygen-oxygen interaction is, uh, is important. So we did a simulation. You can see the simulation tells you that the oxygen-oxygen distance is very, very close. Okay? Now if you see from this direction, you get this picture. Okay, this polymer will helically rotate outside. You have a shell of uh, oxygen atoms. They are located to each other in very close vicinity. Okay, now, so that's the PMP. Okay, this is a visual observation. If you take a spectrum, you get nothing. There's no signal at all. However, if you change the RQ chain by oxygen containing ether, moiety, you see the emissions turn on. Okay? You can also change it to ester, you still see the emission. So, provided you have a lot of oxygen atoms, although they are a lot of conjugated, there's no aromatic green, it can emit light. Okay? So, this is kind of interesting. Now, you know, it's very interesting, but it's very hard to understand. Okay? Because the current to be used to explain why these kind of things can emit light. So we tried very hard to understand what's going on. So here I talk about this uh, through bond conjugation and through space interaction. What is a through bond? This is a normal conjugated system. We make a lot of conjugated molecules. Okay? The pi electrons can flow through the whole molecule. Okay? So we call this as a through bond conjugation of the pi electron delocalization, right? However, if you see the benzene ring here, actually they are not, uh, there's no through bound conjugation. However, they are located in close vicinity, so there's a through space interaction. Okay? So, you know, the place will, you know, link together through this kind of a through space interaction, which is different from the through bound conjugation. Okay? So, from here, we propose the following. 
Now let's see this is a auction item. You know auction is in the periodic table of elements in the right side of the of a periodic table of elements, right? So it has two features. Its electron negativity is high, meaning that it's electron rich, and it has lone pairs, right? So when the auction items are separated, of course there's no emission. Probably, probably they do emit light, but probably in a very, very short wavelength, you cannot see it. Because our lake eye can only see 400 to 700 nanometers. Okay? So it probably in a very, very short wavelength, probably very, very weak emission. I don't know. I have no idea. Okay? However, when the oxygen items come close to each other, they will experience this uh, through space interaction. And uh, that will rigidify the clusters. So this, you know, this uh, cluster ratio, you know, will give you rigid, you know, clusters, and uh, that will go back to the RM mechanism, restriction of uh, intramolecular motion. Everything will become fixed. Okay. Now, this kind of clusters will serve as a cluster managing to emit light. So we call this as a cluster ratio trigger emission or CTE. And the emission is, uh, is, uh, is uh, cluster luminescence. And very interestingly, if you change the size of the clusters, actually you change the color of the emission, which is uh, really interesting, which is really unique. Okay? This is the future of inorganic semiconductor quantum dots. And we realize the inorganic, not aggregates, not clusters. Okay? And uh, even, even more interesting, if my model is correct. What does that mean? Think about it. Okay? In biopolymers, in our body, in proteins, in DNAs, we have a lot of this kind of hydro items of uh, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and, and sulfur. Okay? So this, okay, think about this. This suggests that uh, almost everything should emit light in the aggregate state. Okay, the food you eat, the clothes you wear. Okay, let's see what happens. This is starch you eat in the morning, and this is the clothes you wear. Okay, now you see the solution? If you excite the solution, no emission. Okay, however, if they form aggregates, now you excite it, you get a very strong emission. So, this is the starch you eat. It can emit light. This is the cellulose you wear. It can emit light. Okay. So obviously this is AIE because the monarch species is not emissive, but the aggregates are very emissive. And actually, this is the mixture of both fluorescence and phosphorescence. Okay. So this gives you very exciting possibility. Okay. It's a cellulose. The most abundant biomass on the Earth. Okay, so there's a lot of good features. I just want to tell you these are, of course, biocompatible and environmentally friendly. If you throw it after you use it through to the ground, it will decompose in, in a few days. Okay, but if you use plastic, it takes uh, you know years to decompose. Okay, and another even more exciting possibility. Okay, well, I don't know whether you know that there's a lot of uh, Animals, living things in the deep ocean can emit light. That I think we don't understand that well. Okay, I think <laughs> this kind of you know class luminescence might be the answer of the origin of bioluminescence in the deep ocean. Of course, I put a question mark here. Okay, because I I, I don't know. Okay, I, I'm a chemist. I, I I have no access to those kind of samples. Okay, so if you want to know more, we publish a perspective in the last year talking about the journey of our AIE research. Okay, so we, you know, in that you know, perspective, we talk about this uh, through space conjugation and uh, class luminescence. So basically, okay, I still have uh, some time. I talk about the science, scientific part. In the rest of the time, I will present some examples of the high-tech applications of our, our AI genes. 
Okay, because the time limitation, I will not talk about all of them. Just give you some examples. Okay, you can see, you know, because our stuff, you know, can emit in aggregation state. So you can, you know, you can have a, you know, very smart materials. You can respond to all kinds of uh, uh, stimuli. Okay, and we can have a light emitting nuclear crystal. We can have very efficient OLEDs. We have solar cell waveguides. We can enable you to see the processes which were invisible to you before, and we can use it as a chemical sensor to detect all kinds of, uh, you know, harmful species. We can even visualize your fingerprint. Of course, we can do a lot of things in in life science area. So today I will just talk about the four, you know, systems to to. To tell you, you know, to tell you, to give you some taste of uh, of the applications, although this is by no means complete. Okay, the first one is optics and the electronics. This one, you can see this molecule. When you make it, you get a crystal. The crystal is very very emissive. It emits a very bright yellow light. Okay, now if you just give a, a little bit of mechanical force, you do the grinding, the color will change from yellow. To red, okay. Now, if you heat it up, the, the amorphous state will recrystallize, and this is so-called thermochromic, and this is a mechanochromic, okay. So, this, okay, and again, this is exactly opposite to the transitional system. For transitional system, if it crystallizes, what happens? It will redshift, and the emission will be weakened. And sometimes completely quenched. You can see our system when it crystallizes, it go it blue shift and it becomes very, very emissive. Okay? So it's exactly opposite to the conventional system and uh, it's very, very common to, to our AIE systems. Okay, now many people are interested in this uh, thermally activated DNA fluorescence, so called TADF. Okay? However, if you see the device structure here, although the efficiency is very high. But the row off is very big. You can see at a 5,000 kinetic percent drop in efficiency. Why? Because you have this triplet triplet alienation in the triplet, you know, except system because they are separated. So there's no this TTA system to quench the emission. So potentially we can have a very high efficiency without you know, row off, okay, in a high current density. So, in other sense, we, you know, we make the AIE and the TADF together married to give you this aggregation induced DNA fluorescence, or AIDF. You can see these are the molecules, okay. You see, they are AI active. The solution is not that emissive, but the, the film is very, very emissive, okay. Now, you can see that the lifetime is long. Okay, so this is not, this is a typical, you know, denied fluorescent system, okay, from triplet back to the singlet. And the, the delta ST is very, very small and not enable very efficient, you know, uh, you know, triplet to singlet uh, uh, transformation. And uh, you can see the, the quantum yield is really high, about 23%, okay, and the very, very bright, you know, 100,000 kinetic meter square. It's very, very bright. And even at this very, very high, you know, uh, luminance, you can see the quantum yield is still very high. The row off is much smaller than you know, people have reported. Okay? Okay. Very often, you know, we try to understand, you know, processes. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good technique. See, for example, people make a lot of particles. Okay? You know the starting state, you know the end state, you don't know the, the kinetics, the dynamic process in the middle. Okay, now I give you an example here. So, you know, we use a lot of plastic products in our daily life, but none of them is pure. Many of them are mixtures of different plastics, or sometimes people even add the inward getting thinner into plastic. Of the products, okay. So here is an example of utilizing this MMT. That's a famous, very famous inorganic thinner, to you know to change the polyvinyl chloride. 
property. Of course, you put inorganic phenol into organic system, there will be a macrophage separation. Normally, people may use a electronic microscope to study the phase separation. Okay, the equipment is expensive, the sample preparation is troublesome, and you see very, very small localized region. It's not the whole picture. And we can use our AI engine to make life much easier, okay? Because MMT is selective charge, so we can make a positive charge the AI engine. The electrostatic interaction we bring inorganic, uh, our AI engine to accumulate the thinner region. So by doing that, you can easily see the fish separation in very big area. Okay. In the nature, there are many, many, you know, biomass <laughs> which are wasted in the old time because you cannot process it. Okay, see for example, ketosin, you know, and, oh, by the way, that's the ketosin structure. In the old time, you threw it away. Now we can dissolve it. Now we can process it. Okay, so people now use this kind of biopolymer to make a hydrogels, make a biogel. Okay, and again, Gel is formed. We just attach this AI gene to ketosin, then you can see that's the solution, and this is the gel. We can monitor the whole process from beginning to the end. Okay, and actually the process is easy. This kind of solvent can destroy the hydrogen bond between this kind of, uh, you know, ketosin polymer chain. And if you heat it up, okay, dehydration will lead to the hydrogen bond formation, reformation, and you get the gels. Okay, so you can use your lake eye to monitor the whole process. Okay, humidity is not visible to you, but we can, uh, we can make your, you know, realize the humidity change. How do they? Here, we talk about this uh, twisted intermolecular charge transfer, TSCT. I have not a good detail, uh, just to tell you that, uh, you know, this kind of molecule has a DA structure, and uh, when, when the polarity is high, it can stabilize this twisted DA structure. Okay, now this, you know, polar solvent stabilization will lower down the normal and increase the HOMO. So the gap will become smaller. That will make this kind of TICT molecule responsive to the change in polarity. The more polar the environment, the redder the emission. Okay, so we, you know, we utilize our AI gene, we put our AI gene into very hydrophilic polymer, such as polyacrylic acid. You know, it's the materials utilized for, for diaper for baby, okay, because it can absorb a lot of water. Now, you can see when the relative humidity is low, it emits blue light. If you increase the polarity by increasing the you see the color will all the way change to red. So this is one system. And if you, if you change a lot of AI gene, you have a lot of set of uh, color change. Okay, so from the color change, you will know the polarity, you will know the humidity in air. Okay? Now, the stress strain distribution is very important for mechanical parts. Okay, so for example, the airplane, before it flies, you have to do the window tunnel test. To, to check out the focal points of stress because that, not, not that the, you know, the location eventually needed to the mechanical damage, okay? So we have a very, you know, simple molecule, but it behavior very interesting. It's amorphous, does, it amorphous emit very efficiently, but it crystal does not emit not efficiently. Okay, so we can, you know, this molecule can easily form crystals on the metal surface. Okay, now when it's crystallized, the emission is quenched. There's no emission here. But once you give a force, okay, to make the sample to change, the crystal structure will be destroyed. You get amorphous. Now you start to see the emission. Okay, you can see this is a real sample. This is our experimental data. This is a theoretical simulation. At the first glance, you think they are similar. Yes, they are very similar. However, if you check the detail, they are different. Okay? You can see that's the focal point of stress. That's, the, 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 that's what the people really want to detect. Okay? Because the damage will start from here. You can see theoretical simulation tell you nothing 
but uh, you know, we can clearly tell you this is the point you have to pay attention to. Okay? Okay, we can also use our stuff for chemical sensing. We can sense almost everything. Okay? I, I give you one example to tell you the design principle. Okay? So here, see for example, if you want to detect detect zinc, how do you do it? You just put you know, the ligand which can coordinate with uh, zinc as, as the rotor of the AI gene. Okay? And uh, you know, once, you know, once the AI gene meet with, uh, with the zinc, okay, this ligand will coordinate with uh, the ionic species, will form a you know, big polymer, it will you know, give you aggregates which will turn on the emission. Okay? So for zinc, we use terpidin because we know terpidin has a very good bonding constant, very high bonding constant with zinc. Okay, so instantly you get a high polymer, you get aggregates. Okay, so initially you can see this can emit a weak blue light, but once uh, you know it form aggregates, you get a very strong yellow light. So this will give you a ratio metric change that we enable you to do a quantitative analysis. Now, if you change it to another metallic species. See, for example, if you want to detect the calcium, what do you do? You change the ligand to carboxylic acid. Okay? Then you can, you can detect the calcium. So you change the ionic species, you change the ligand. Okay? So by doing that, basically you can detect any ionic species. We have done a lot, but today I only give you one example here to demonstrate the design principle. Another example is about a gas detection, carbon dioxide. Okay? So you may wonder how can AI gene be used for gas detection? We can do it. Okay? You know, carbon dioxide is acidic. And uh, amine is a basic. So you put a base and acid together, what do you do? You get a salt. Okay, what is a salt? Salt is ionic species, it's very polar, viscosity is very high. Okay, so this ionic liquid, you know, will, will restrict the, the molecular motion of our AI gene. Okay, you can see, you know, if you put our AI gene in a mean solution without the carbon dioxide, you see no emission. However, in the presence of uh, carbon dioxide, the molecular motion becomes difficult. Okay, the high polarity of the ionic liquid will force our AI gene to form aggregates. So you can see the emission becomes stronger and stronger. And uh, you know, you, you, you know, by doing this, you can use your naked eye to see carbon dioxide. The last example is about uh, biomedical applications. Okay, so here I talk about the pH. This pH is not the pH meter pH paper you use in the lab. This pH sensor is about the pH change inside the cell. Okay? So here you can see that's the AI gene. We put this uh, red ionic species here to make it water soluble. Remember, okay, it's not emissive once it's soluble. Okay? So in, in the aqueous medium, it's non emissive. However, if you go to acidic condition, this proton will destroy the negative charge here, and this one is not soluble anymore in water, so it will form aggregates in acidic condition. It emit very efficiently, you know, as a right emitter, okay? It emit right emi uh, light. Now, if you go to a basic condition, this hydroxy group will react with a double bond here and destroy the positive charge here. Again, this one is not water soluble anymore, however, the color of the emission now changes from red to blue because the conjugation is broken here. Okay? So by doing that, now you will know, you know which part of the cell is uh, alkaline, which part is uh, acidic. Okay? Now, you know, our nuclear is making DNA every day, but then nobody knows how it's done. Uh, how the process is working, right? So here, we, you know, we put this EDU, okay, into the system, so when, you, you know, when the nucleus is making DNA, it incorporates this triple bond to the newly formed DNA double strand, okay? Now, you know, you know this triple bond can easily react with azide, 
okay, to link our AI gene to the new uniform, you know, DNA double strand. So by doing that, you will know which nuclear is uh, making DNA, which one is uh, sleeping or, or is uh, dysfunction. Okay, so actually in the market, that's a, that's a commercial product, but you can see the emission is not that strong, and if I add more, actually the emission is weakened because the ACQ effect. But uh, for our system, you can see emission initially is stronger, and you add more, the more you add, the stronger the emission. That's the AIE feature, right? And another difference is that of a conventional system, there's a photo bleaching problem. So when you try to see the picture, you know, the, the strong laser beam will destroy the, the dye, okay, in air, this is due to the photo oxidation. But you can see our system is very stable, photochemically very stable. Protein fibrosis is a, is a process very, very important to our health, okay? See, for example, if the protein of your liver become fibrous, now that we need to do this cirrhosis, your liver will become hot. <laughs> you, will have, you will suffer, right? And if the protein in your brain becomes fibrous, and according to the current model, you will have Alzheimer's, you have Parkinson's, okay? So it's very, very important to monitor the fibrosis process of proteins. So here, we use a protein, uh oh Here, we use a protein called insulin. And when it's uh, in a native state, you put our water-soluble AIG into it, you see no emission. However, insulin protein is very easy to form fiber, okay? Once it forms fiber, you get a very strong emission. Actually, you can monitor the whole, you know, kinetic process uh, for the fiber formation of the protein polymers. And very often, we need to do the long-term tracking, especially for cancer cells. Okay, see so for example, the cancer can migrate from one organ to another organ. Okay, and the doctors actually really want to see how it's migrating inside your body. Okay, so here we, you know, use this, uh, you know, chitosin AI gene bioconjugate. We can monitor the cell, okay, for 15 passengers. And you probably think this is not long enough. We can do even longer. You can see, you know, my collaborator used our AI gene to monitor the stem cell therapy process for almost one and a half months. Okay, so long enough to enable you to, you know, monitor the whole process uh, for the therapy, you know, uh, process. Okay. You know, inside our cell, you have many organelles. Okay, see, for example, mitochondria is the power plant of your cell. If, uh, you know, if it has problem, you will suffer, okay? So, many people have developed mitochondria-specific bioprobe. This is our AI system. You can see the, the resolution is really high. We have all kinds of color, blue, green, yellow, red, and this is an example for our yellow mitochondria specific bioprobe. And very interestingly, you can see our AI gene, okay? Whenever it meets with a cancer cell, it will immunize, but normal cell will not. You can see cancer cell, normal cell, cancer cell, normal cell, okay? So this is a, this is a very interesting, okay? Sorry. You know, this actually is a very simple molecule, okay? So I call this as a wide spectrum of cancer cell differentiation. Whenever you meet with cancer cell, you even light. But when you have a normal cell, it does not, okay? Of course, the doctor will ask you, hey, Dr. Tan, I only want to see one particular cancer cell, not all the cancer cell, okay? Of course, we can do it. So here we do the bioconjugation with antibody, okay? You can see that's the bioconjugate we have made. You can see the stock shift is very, very big, more than 200 nanometers. This is a commercial product. You can see size 3 is widely used in the lab, but you can see the stock shift is very, very small, less than 20 nanometers. 
Another difference is that uh, you know, if you use this size 3 antibody bioconjugate, you put it into the you know, incubation system, everything will emit light. You have a very, very strong background. So you have to wash. The washing process is, is a technique very difficult to master. If you wash too much, it gives you false negative. If you wash less, it will give you false positive. Okay, it's very, very difficult to, to know which is the, the appropriate point for washing. Okay, but for our AA system, because the antibodies are water soluble, outside you don't see any emission. Okay, when it's soluble in water, it's no emission. It emits only after it accumulates inside the tumor cell. Okay, so that is why we don't need to wash because we don't have background. So we call this as a wash free imaging okay, of cancer cells. So here, you know, bio imaging people like, you know, low wavelength emission. So you can see the emission here is long enough, it's in the near IR2 region. And here I used two videos to tell you the difference of our system with the conventional system. You see, this conventional system, you can see the syringe is uh, emitting because the conventional system solution is emissive. You see, our solution is not emissive. Now, if you inject to the mouse body, okay, it will form aggregate. Once the aggregate is formed, you can see our AI aging become more and more emissive. This one becomes less and less emissive. Okay? We want to use this kind of long wavelength emission because we want to see the interior structure of the mouse without open stomach. Because uh, long wavelengths can enable deep penetration. Okay? So we inject our AI aging to the tail of the mouse. Uh, without the open stomach, you can see the interior structure. Okay, now you can see about three hours have passed. You see our AIA gene is still very emissive, but this one, you know, become very, very weak. Okay. So, so far, I have been, you know, trying to suppress molecular motion to enhance the emission. However, if you think about it, the molecular motion can also do good things. Okay. As I mentioned, molecular motion will generate heat. Okay? If you utilize it well, it will give you very good photothermal you know, efficiency. So here we try to make the molecule you know, movable, even in the solid state, in the aggregation state. So we attach this kind of known arc chain with branches. Okay? So in this kind of state, if you excite it, no emission, but you get a very high temperature. Okay, so what we do is that uh, we use this kind of PEG 2000 polyethylene glycol, very flexible stuff, to you know to make another particles. Okay, in the hope that if you irradiate, we can get a very you know efficient photothermal effect. Effect will enable you to do the photoacoustic imaging. Okay, so you can see. Now that's the best system you know, in the literature. My, my colleague reported this system in Nature Nanotechnology. Okay? You can see our system is much better in terms of uh, temperature generation. Okay? This is uh, you know, the, the reference, this is our system. You can see instantly you can generate a very, very high temperature once you read it. Okay? And because of this, you know, the nanoparticle, you know, the nanoparticle has this so-called Enhance the permeation and the retention, so called EPI effect, to just go to the tumor tissue. Okay? So you can see the tumor gives you you know, much brighter photoacoustic image than the normal tissue. You can see the difference. You can see the difference. Okay? Okay, at the end, you know, I talk about how to label our system to all these uh, bioanalysts. Okay? One of the commonly used method is clinical reaction. However, the traditional clinical reaction use copper catenin. But don't like copper because copper is toxic. Okay? So we have developed one system, you know, we don't need any metal. It's metal free. Okay? So what we do actually, we just put a carbon here to activate the alkaline trip one. Okay? So you can see we don't use metal. We just, you know, just mix them at the room temperature, 
without any prefunctionalization because you know all these kind of virus species as either amine, amino group or thiol group or hydroxy groups. You just mix them together, you got bio, bio conjugation. So the bio species can be you know natural polymers like cellulose, okay, and the peptides, proteins, cells, bacteria, and viruses. Of course, we cannot do viruses, so that's why we didn't do virus here, but theoretically we can do it. Okay? So here, some example, you see the protein? You just mix the protein with our AI gene, you can see the protein is labeled. Okay? Very easy, very simple. Water. Okay, room temperature, no metal. And uh, the cell, two minutes, you just mix with a cell, two minutes, you get the emission. Okay? These are the control, no emission, okay? And the bacteria, again, you just mix them together, the bacteria will emit light. Very simple and very easy. Okay, finally, I would like to compare transitional system with our system. This transitional system, this our system. AIE, you can use high concentration because we don't worry about aggregation. High concentration, okay, has two, you know, advantages, okay. Our AI molecule just go to the tumor cell to accumulate. Okay, so we have a high current region, have a very bright emission, and when the current region is high enough, eventually it will kill the tumor cell because it will interfere with the metabolism of the cell. So eventually it changes to a drug, and uh, our system is wash free because outside when it's water soluble, there's no background emission, and the response is turn on. Because of that, it can get a very high resolution, and our system is resistant to photo bleaching. Okay, you can take a picture without worrying too much. Okay, and uh, we can do long-term tracking, and we have uh, this built-in specificity to cancer cell. We don't, of course, we can use antibody, but it's not necessarily needed. Okay, not a particle perfect, not a particle. Can you know can go to the tumor cell through this EPR effect, okay? And we can have a very very big uh, stock shift. So let me summarize. So basically, I talk about two parts today: fundamental and application. Because I'm a chemist, okay? For chemist, basically you study structure property relationship. So structure-wise, we figure out our AI genes are molecular rotors and molecular vibrators. So the working mechanism is a restriction of intramolecular motion, and we have identified some very unique processes which are not possible in solution state. Okay, like this anti kasha system and kasha illumination systems. And in terms of education, we have worked you know, in the area of energy, environmental, and health. These are so-called grand challenges faced by the whole society, by our human being. So, if you want to know more, at the end of 2015, we published a very long review article, 223 pages. Okay? So if you read out the paper, you will know, you know uh, what people have done until 2015, although the area is, uh, is progressing very, very fast. So the AIE actually you know, opens a lot of possibilities, okay? like this uh, AIDF. Okay, in the solution state, you cannot realize we have this RTP again, that's the aggregates. We have anti kasha system, class luminescence, through space interaction, mechanoluminescence. Today I did not talk about this. This mechanoluminescence means you don't use light to excite, you just give a force, you will emit light. Okay, but today I had a lot of time to discuss about this, but if you are interested, you can read our paper here. We have a circular polarized luminescence. Again, yeah, I did not talk about it. Okay, you know, we can use a chiral AI gene to generate, a, you know, helically rotating, you know, assembly. That will give you very high, you know, very efficient circular polarized luminescence, which is uh, which is good for 3D display. Okay, in the future, you know. People will jump out from the mobile phone, okay? <laughs> and uh, you know we have uh, trying to develop AI systems from uh, naturally occurring products such as the Chinese medicine, 
Okay, because this, the good thing is that uh, we can tell you where the drug is and how the drug is functioning. Okay, and we have this uh, aggregation enhanced uh, reactive oxygen species uh, generation. I did not talk about it. Okay, and not you know enable us to have a very efficient photodynamic therapy system. And uh, recently, we have been working on solid-state molecular motion, which is very, very important for the development of uh, molecular machines. Okay, so far people you know, use NMR to see is how the molecules will move in the solution state. But eventually you have to go to solid state. But there's no good technique to see how the molecules are moving in the solid state. Okay, and uh, you know, we have done some very interesting work, although I did not talk about that today. Okay, so now many groups in the world are working on AI systems. You can see last year more than 2,000 papers have been published and citation is uh, you know, also growing exponentially. And because of that, Sigma Outreach is sending our AIE compounds and uh, if you want to save money, my students are running a small company. We sell cheaper, okay? But of course, if you need uh, free samples, just send me an email. I will give you free samples, okay? So next year is uh, 20 years of uh, AIE research. So Ang Wang is going to uh, publish a special issue. And if you, you know, it happens you are working on AIE, you're welcome to submit your, your best paper to this uh, special issue. And uh, at the end of uh, next year in Hawaii, we have an AIE symposium. I hope to see you in Hawaii next year. And uh, finally, I would like to thank my students, uh, postdocs, especially my research collaborators. I have many, many you know, collaborators in the whole world. Okay? I thank them for their great contribution. And I also thank the funding agencies for the financial support. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>